Uh, let's go ahead and get started here. Uh, grab this piece of paper that looks like this. That come out of this magazine here, Space News, and this is a, a new uh, magazine that comes out once a week that, about all the things that are happening in, uh, in the space community. But there were some articles in it that I thought was, was worth uh, reading. Um, the first one on your page there, uh, on, under the title, Space Weather Tracking Site Still Active. And the important part of it is the part that I've got uh, circled in the box. And this, let's go over and read it. It says, the Space Weather Prediction Center researchers monitor solar activity and predict p potential impacts of storms such as coronal mass ejections, which blast huge clouds of charged particles into space at incredible speeds. CMEs that hit the Earth squarely inject large amounts of energy into the planet's magnetic field Spawning potential, spawning potential devastating geomatic, geomagnetic storms that can disrupt GPS signals, radio communication, power grids for days. The Space Weather Prediction Center work helps the operators of spacecraft, power grids, and other potentially affected infrastructure prepare and, uh, and protect against such impacts. In addition to the Space Weather Prediction Center, uh, website. NOAA is continuing to maintain the National Hurricane Center portable for several other sites that uh, are considered uh, vital to protecting human life and property. So, you know, we talked about these uh, ejections and what they do. And then on the, the second one here under the comments section in the, in the part from uh, Joseph N. Pelton, um, the, the thing that talks about Initially here is in uh, uh, Siberia, there was a um, meteorite that exploded and, and uh, uh, alerted, kind of alerted the world about the, the dangers of meteorites. And uh, uh, some of the parts actually hit, um, hit the ground. And if you uh, do some Googling on it, you'll see that they got a, one of the parts of the meteorite that's about so big. But just the... Um, sonic boom of it uh, broke a lot of windows. Uh, no one was killed, but you know, it was pretty devastating. But there where I got the line, uh, uh, down at the, starting down at the bottom, the solar events can do enormous damage to our global infrastructure, such as the 1989 event that took out electrical transmission systems from Chicago to Montreal. A powerful solar storm like the so-called so uh, Car Carrington event of 1859 could potentially wipe out electrical grids, satellites, and even our computers and the internet. Why should we be concerned? Earth is protected by its atmospheres and the geomag uh, geomagnetic sphere and the Van Allen belts, which are shaped by the Earth's magnetic field. Satellites, projects that are examining the Earth's magnetosphere, such as the cluster uh, time as time history and event, micro scale um, interaction during storms. That's where time is comes from. And the newly launched Van Allen probes are showing us alarming data that there are cracks in the magnetosphere. Such gaps in the protective shield can allow poisonous gases and radiation to pour through. And such events are thought to have already killed millions of birds and fish. Um, Earth's protective atmosphere in recent decades has been weakened as demonstrated in the form of the so-called polar ozone holes. Meanwhile, solar radiation is gradually heating up the Earth as we are witnessing in the form of climate change. In short, we now need to worry not only about solar radiation heating that comes with the greenhouse gases building up, but also about whether we will be adequately protected from the solar and cosmic radiation and solar storms. Increasing, there seems to be um, legitimate concern that if we are not able to develop some form of high altitude blinds against solar and cosmic radiation, we and lots of other species on Earth could be literally cooked to death. This does not mean that we would be roasted medium well done 
like one in the oven, but we, it could mean that the genetic materials would wipe out our natural reproduction powers as it has already been detected in frogs and locations under the ozone hole. So anyway, that's, you know, talking about that. And I got the second half of that article on the next page. We won't, we won't go through it. But, you know, here's current information uh, about that. One of the interesting things that I read about the, <clears throat> the Van Allen belts is this new probe actually found a third belt which is interesting, that formed and apparently because we're near the high or at the high in the solar cycles right now, they saw this third belt and when the solar cycles, um, when the flares go down, actually the belt disappears. So they didn't know before they sent this probe up that it's actually a, a third belt. So, you know, the things that we're talking about here in the class are, are you know, really things that are, that are happening right now. Um, let's see, I wanted to show you some, uh, some other things here. Um, uh, I was looking up, I had a, a question. Uh, my son and I, my grandson and I went to the drag races down here at, uh, what is it, Owingsville? Any of you ever been there to the drag race? Pretty cool, right? They really have some nice cars. I was asking him, what did he think the zero to 60 speed was on a Tesla? And I said, I think it's in uh, maybe three or four seconds. He said, ah, no, Grandpa, it isn't that fast. Let me read you something here. This is Tesla 0 to 60. Uh, I found it here. It was actually 3.9 seconds. The fastest 0 to 60 of any production car. So when you get your Tesla, go have fun, all right? What, what makes a Tesla so amazing in the speed? Does anybody know? The DC motors, it turns out on DC motors at zero RPM or right above zero RPM, they have a tremendous, tremendous amount of torque. If you do not restrain a DC motor when you apply power to it, uh, this thing will run away from itself and blow up. And the reason I know that is I had a class uh, in my undergraduate degree uh, at the University of Idaho and they had part of our class because it was in the area where uh, a lot of the jobs were with the uh, public utilities companies, the dams and, and all of the electric utilities. We had to take a course in running series and DC motors and these motors were big. They're about that big round and you had these cords that you plugged in and if you did not put a generator hooked to that motor so it had some restraint on it, those motors, if they got away from you, would blow up. And I had, I think there was about three other students in the lab class that were working, uh, we were working together on one, and somebody tripped and pulled the cord out to the generator. That motor started, started winding up. All three of the other students left the room, you know, and I was standing there, what do I do, what do I do? And I finally, yanked out the power to the motor, but I, boy, that thing was really going bouncing on this concrete floor, and I'm, I'm gonna die. <laughs> so anyway, little, a little aside here. I wanna show you one other thing that I think is really cool. How many of you have heard of the SpaceX grasshopper? None of you? Is it the reusable? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, if he can bring that first stage back, that's three quarters of the cost of the rocket launch. Three quarters. It's like an airliner that you get on and it only flies once and then you have to get a new airliner. That's the way the rocket launch business is today. And so he's building this rocket called, and he calls it the grasshopper. And the intent is, is after the first stage gets up to the point that it's done what it needs to, then it's supposed to come back and land. So he's doing some testing on that, and I'll show you a short video here, which I think is, is kind of cool. And one of the interesting things about the video, has ever, anybody ever seen these little model quadcopters that have four engines on them? That's what they use to videotape this thing flying. They send this little, somebody's flying this little quadcopter that's got, a, that's got a cam on it, and that's what they use to do it. I thought, that's pretty cool. Uh, so let's watch that. 
<clears throat> I think we have to watch a commercial first. Let's see. Some families you're born into. Others require initiation. These families might not have the same roots, but they can touch the buck if necessary. And no matter how many splits they may face, they always stick together. For all your families, Gallo Family Vineyards. Celebrate them all by making custom family crests at crestcreator.com. Now notice there's a um, stand right on the bottom of the rocket so they can stand it up by itself. And some of the flights that they went on, they have this dummy cowboy that they set on it and tie down. But I don't think they have it on this one. Now that remember that this is the Falcon 9. The Falcon 9 has nine engines on and they're just doing this with one single engine. See the, uh, the arm of the quadcopter there. That's something you know um, they're going to fly you know they've already flown two dragon capsules resupply dragon capsules up to the International Space Station and they're supposed to have have two more um, two more that they're going to fly this year okay this is where we were on the presentation It's on section two. Okay, um, with respect to the lab, if you can this afternoon, get your RC cars and your toolbox and everything out, bring them in here, because this is the room that you'll have tomorrow. Anybody have any question about anything that you want to know about how to make your car autonomous or anything? It's not, yeah, ask the class last year not easy. You run into the wall more times than you want to. So give it a try tomorrow and I think you're not probably going to get it ready by next Friday if you wait if you just do it tomorrow and lab and then wait for the lab on Friday. I think you better practice during next week to try to get it to do it because it, it, it's unless you really know what you're doing it's hard okay so everybody have fun tomorrow I'm sorry I'm I'm not gonna be here I would like to be here because sometimes it gets very funny to laugh at students frustrated but okay we were talking about contamination uh, last time and um, talking about this is the particle contamination this is the designation of clean rooms if you go to a clean room like we've got out here there are two areas in the clean room I think we have one area that's a 10,000 class clean room and then we have and that's an inner room and then we have another one in the outer room that's a 1,000 class and that just means how many particles that you have in uh, a a volume like a cubic meter so if you uh, go to some of the places where they build uh, hard disks for computers or things like that there are some of those that are like hundred thousand clean rooms those are the ones you see with a people with a complete bunny suit on and and everything at least in ours they ask you to put uh, covers on your shoes so this is the this is what it means if somebody says well what is the class of your clean room okay 
So in the, the natural environment, and I think we talked about this, there are the atomic impacts, which are atomic dra uh, air dynamic drag, sputtering materials from space, atomic oxygen, because the oxygen up there, because of the uh, plasma and other things, has stripped off, and the atomic oxygen is highly chemically reactive. And one of the things that you use to uh, protect your satellite in places is uh, Kapton. And the effect of this environment is it can change the emissivity and, and uh, passivity of your satellite. Um, plasma, where is plasma the highest? What, uh, what, would you, uh, what you see here is you see that the plasma density varies uh, depending on whether it's day or night or whether it's solar min or solar max. And you see that it can vary from the minimum there of what, 10 to the 11th, clear up to maybe 10 to the 14th or something. So it can be quite a bit of difference. But notice the altitude at which these peaks are at. They're in the, between the 200 and 300 kilometers. Where's the International Space Station normally? It's how, how high? 350 kilometers is generally the, the height of the space station. Okay. Uh, if your spacecraft is charging, one of the things that you can do is have a, a um, generator that generates ions that are the opposite polarity of what you're being charged at to neutralize it. So what happens when you have spacecraft charging? You get spurious electronic switching activities, like things like turning on and turning off things that you don't want to turn on and off. Maybe things like activating your, your radio. Breakdown of the thermal coating that you might have on the outside. Uh, amplifier and uh, solar cell degradation. And degradation of uh, optical surfaces where they can actually, if you have charged particles and they hit the optics, they can actually pit the optics. Um, so can uh, spacecraft charging can build up on one side of your spacecraft and if it arcs over to the other, you're apt to get uh, the electronics killed. Um, the kinds of radiation particles that you're going to see is alpha, beta, and gamma. So uh, alpha is the helium nucleus and beta is electrons or positrons. Uh, gamma is a photon. Where do they come from? They're trapped in the radiation belt. They come from the galactic cosmic rays and uh, solar polar events. Okay, This is what the uh, magnitude of the flux looks like for the different types of radiation. You see the electrons have uh, 0.1 MeV, that's million electron volts, uh, and you can see the, the density of those. And what you can see in the electrons is you see that dip in it. That indicates that's the, the dip between the inner and the outer belt. Okay. Um, where do the cosmic rays come from? They come uh, from within the equatorial plane. The uh, magnetic fields reflect the rays back to space and into the polar regions. The Earth's magnetic field fluctuates with solar, po uh, solar cycles. And uh, the uh, GCRs, the galactic uh, cosmic rays, are the highest at solar max. Okay, anybody have any questions on that? Okay, well, let's go on to the, to the second section there. Okay, so meteorites, uh, orbital debris. Um, so they're up there. We get them from both places. It's kind of like you messed up your own nest when you started launching satellites and didn't clean up the place. So that's something we have to live with now. So single event upsets, we've talked a little bit about those, but just a refresher here. It can uh, damage uh, data that's stored. It can damage software. It can cause the CPU, the central processor, to halt. It can change the code such that the uh, central processor will write, it could write over itself or write over data ta uh, tables. And uh, can, it causes various uh, unplanned events uh, due to faulty commands. So it's, uh, you've got to try and protect for this if you can. Uh, let's see. What is this? What's happening here? We've seen this once before. 
You know, you've got a high energy particle coming in, it hits the atmosphere and generates all of these other particles that are there. So even if you, uh, uh, and this also can happen in the materials inside of your satellite. I think it was talked about before, I think uh, uh, Dr. McNeil talked about uh, shielding. What happens, uh, let's say you say, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take care of this. I'm going to put, uh, you know, two-inch aluminum shielding around my satellite. Does that help you? No. What happens? It makes it worse, right? Because what happens is if you slow these particles down enough, they actually cause additional particles. So I've been told that roughly the the amount of sh the maximum amount of aluminum shielding, if you're going to use that, that you should have, is probably about three eighths of an inch. Any more than that, it's going to be worse than than that because of the high energy uh, particles. Also, one of the things that's often used to shield uh, integrated circuits is tantalum. So if you even take a little sheet of tantalum and put over areas that are sensitive in your in your electronics it can it can help <laughs> okay solar proton events uh, occurs with coronal mass ejections last one to five days and one about here in 1989 an event could have killed astronauts on the moon if they were out in their spacesuits okay here's what happens to uh, Solar cells, uh, what you see there is what's called the, the IV curve, the current voltage curve. And what you get when you operate your solar cells is you want it to operate right here because that's the maximum power point. And so you, you want this kind of voltage on your cell and this will give you this kind of current. So this is what you want. But as you, as you get degradation due to radiation, uh, you lose power and a good a good kind of rule of thumb that I've heard is you lose uh, Depending on where you at lose about 2% of the power per year. So let's say you wanted to uh, Have a thousand watts for your satellite uh, If you wanted it to last 10 years, then you might have to start with 14 or 1500 watts to begin with So that as it degrades you'll at least have enough at the end of life Okay, here's a chart predicting the radiation dose, and it's kind of interesting there. If you look at the first one, uh, it's 450 kilometers, but it's 28 and a half degrees. Does anybody know where you would launch from and get 28 and a half degrees? Where? 28 and a half? Turns out uh, Cape Kennedy is 28 and a half. So if you launch straight east from Cape Kennedy, you all, an orbit always has to go around the center of the Earth. So that means the highest inclination it would get, the highest north it would go and the maximum south it would go is 28 and a half degrees. Now if you take off from the Cape and you go right up along the coast, you can get something like uh, 57 degrees. Why can't they go straight north? from the Cape. Well, what will they go over if they go straight north? Well, no, they'll go over land, populated land. So they don't want to fly over populated land. It hurts people when you drop stages on them, you know, it just hurts people. So that when you see things that go from at 57 degrees, it's probably went from the Cape. Now, over at Vandenberg, over here on the California coast, if you ever look at the coastline, Vandenberg, you come up past Santa Barbara, and then Vandenberg, then the coastline kind of swings out to the west there. And so what they can do is they can fly polar flights because they can fly straight south. So you can't fly straight south out of out of the Cape, you can you can only go east and slightly north. So you can fly out of um, you can fly out of Vandenberg. Uh, you can. There is a company called Sea Launch that has a big oil platform. They launch off of the oil platform, so they just pull it out in the ocean. 
Um, there is um, uh, Kodiak, Alaska has got a launch site. There's a new launch uh, in French uh, Guiana uh, on the uh, north coast, northeast coast of South America is actually where um, ESA, the European Space Agency, has a launch site. And then there's a new one that they're putting down in Brazil. But now look at the, look at the amount of uh, predicted dosage you get when you go at uh, 28 degrees. Now if you go 57 degrees, still the same uh, altitude. Why does the uh, amount of predicted dosage go down? If you look at the Van Allen belts, okay, where would the, where is the Van Allen belt have the maximum density? I think over the equator. So the more inclination you get, the less dense you see the the Van Allen belt, okay. And then if you go 90 degrees, it goes down even a little bit more there. Uh, geostationary orbits. They're uh, way out there, but uh, notice uh, the shielding there, they've talked about the shielding at the, at the low Earth orbits is 1.0 grams per centimeter squared, and then when they go in geostationary orbits, they actually have 2 grams per centimeter squared, so they got more shielding, but they got almost the same radiation as you get at 57 and 90 degrees. So there is still radiation out at the... Uh, um, out at geostationary orbits. Okay, single event offsets have soft damage, hard damage. Soft damage you can recover by uh, recycling power. Hard damage means that you've got permanent damage. Um, single event uh, upsets, um, flips bits in the RAM, uh, causes the uh, devices and, uh, to, uh, and then there's also single event latch ups which causes the, the device to stay in a state and may not be resettable until it's powered down. So there's two things, the, the bit flip, okay, which you can do something about. There is also the latch up, which the best way to handle it is detect high current draw and recycle the power. Okay, here's just some showing some uh, proton flux and some electron flux densities. Uh, so how do you protect against radiation? Uh, buy rad hard parts. Companies make rad hard parts. Anybody ever check the price on a rad hard part? Uh, maybe if you're lucky you can find it. Let's say you pick a part that you want to use. Can you find it? it you, a lot of the original integrated circuits were built for the military and they were built rad hard, okay? They did special things to them to make sure that they did not get upset or damaged with uh, space radiation. And then, as the consumer electronics business come along, it was much more profitable for the companies making things, and that the things that they made for the military was very expensive, okay? maybe a hundred or even a thousand times what the commercial price would be. And sometimes what they do is they just sort the ones that they had and test them. And the ones that met the military requirement, they charge a thousand times for, and the others that didn't, they would sell them commercially. So, you know, to Radio Shack, one of those places that have good components. Um, but as the commercial electronics uh, industry started growing, the military would go back to the manufacturer and say, well, I want you to make this part again. They say, no, we don't want to do it. Why? Well, we don't have the facilities set up to make that anymore. Besides, you can't pay enough. We're selling a lot more stuff commercially than you can pay us to build it. So they've ended up with military things that they can't buy parts for to uh, repair them. So the older stuff, you know, a lot of things if it's really critical they have to redesign it with new components and they can't necessarily find components. What has happened to the density of the integrated circuits over the years? Have they changed the density of the integrated circuits? 
Yeah. What did, uh, did anybody remember um, uh, a thing called Moore's Law? What is Moore's Law? Anybody? The evolution of technology. The amount of transistors that you can cram into a processor. Yeah, what, what it is, there's a guy at Intel, one of the integrated circuit manufacturers in California, after they'd been working in the business for a while, he sat down and he started plotting um, the amount of transistors uh, that they were putting in a single chip. And what he found is he found that every two years, the amount of transistors would double. So double here, two years, more, more, more. And so that become known as Moore's Law, okay? So if somebody says, what was Moore's Law? You can say it's, it was, um, I can't remember his first name, but a guy from Intel predicted the rate with which the number of transistors would, would, would be in integrated circuits. Like, what do you get, kind of power do you get out of the processor in your laptop now compared to when you used to have a, a um, uh, Atari? Do you ever have an Atari? So some of these older ones. So that, that's what Moore's Law is. But think about this. If you start cramming more and more of these transistors uh, and components into a smaller area, what about the effect of radiation? There's more likely chance that a particle will come. That's right. A particle has more stuff to hit. So some of the newer uh, components that we have now are worse than the old components, all right, because of the, the uh, compactness of the, of the transistors, the number of transistors. The Apple Power PC chip, the one that was developed that uh, Apple picked up in the 1990s, is still one of the most popular chips that you can put on a satellite because it's just big enough that it's harder for those particles to hit it. Yeah. It's, it's just powerful enough to do everything that you can do. Right, yeah. But we, you know, in the small satellite industry, Nobody seems to get too excited about it. You pick the one you want and you just go fly it. So what? Uh, I don't know of any particular one that, that uh, has said anything about the pickaxe. As the pickaxe might have flown before. I know the MSP430 has flown, but I did get an email that from some guys that said the RFM22B was a piece of junk. They couldn't get it to, to work. Uh, they did balloon flights with it. It didn't work, all sorts of stuff. So what do we have on our uh, uh, pocket cubes? RFM 22Bs. So we'll see. We'll see how good they are. All right. So uh, buy rad hard parts, but we can't afford them. Rad tolerant part selections. Depending on the process they use to make the integrated circuits, some things are more tolerant than other. Uh, shielding, putting shielding on, but you're restricted by the thickness and the weight. Uh, so you need some protection against different types of radiation. Okay. Uh, atomic oxygen, remember we said it was very uh, reactive against material on the surface. And if you look at it here, the atomic oxygen is really... Um, it goes down quite a bit when you get to, to higher altitudes, okay. Space debris, there's different types, natural space debris and man-made space debris. Uh, we get debris from comets. Uh, we get debris from man-made things. Uh, this is what it looks like. You can see how the debris has grown from 1960 to, to 2009. A uh, tremendous amount. Uh, one of the things that we'll do when we get into orbits is we'll go into the uh, theater and there's some really good uh, good films on all of the material that's, a, uh, that's around. Okay, so what about this uh, space debris? This probably is about maybe um, five to ten years old, but there's 20,000 metric tons launched uh, into orbit around the Earth in the last 40 years. 15,000 of it returned to Earth. Uh, 150,000 objects larger than one centimeter. Uh, the Earth orbit is, they're now tracking at least 10,000. I'm sure it's more than that. 
Um, in Leo, they track stuff that's 10 to 30 centimeters, and in Geo, up to one meter. Uh, On-orbit explosions create numbers of debris objects, and uh, it's saying here that there's uh, 700 operational satellites in Earth orbit. I think there's significant more. How many people have here seen that show Gravity? What happened in it? The Russians exploded a satellite and caused a crap ton of space debris to be thrown into orbit and it upset it image. Right. But what's, what happened a few years ago that's very similar to that? Does anybody know? The Chinese was trying out one of their missiles and they shot down one of their own satellites on purpose. And what that did is created a huge debris field. So that's what everybody's trying to keep everybody else from doing, is creating these debris fields. And occasionally they have to, uh, they actually have to move the International Space Station because it might get hit by debris. <clears throat> Does it look like we got anything up there? Quite a bit, right? Now notice the <clears throat> the concentration, that one ring, that's the geostationary belt. And you see, look right down close to the Earth, you can see all of the LEO satellites. All of this other stuff in between is different kind of orbits. And what they do on the LEO stuff, you're supposed to <clears throat> bring your satellite back down at the end of life and burn it up on the... Uh, geostationary, what they do is they push it out into a higher orbit, a junk orbit as they call it. Okay? You wonder that more things don't run into each other. Uh, solar sails, one of the things they've talked about is to, <coughs> is to use something like a solar sail or another satellite <coughs> to go around and capture some of the space junk and, and actually bring it down. So just showing a few, you can take a spacecraft and one way to keep it from uh, getting hit by uh, um, some debris and especially the solar wind is to uh, create a magnetic field around it. When you have a launch, here's where space degree, uh, the, the total uh, plan of a space mission. So you have your launch. Um, what you want to do is make sure that your spent stages of your uh, rocket, like the, it'll drop the first stage off, it's generally low enough, it comes back down in. When you get up and release your satellites, what happened in the past is that the stages up there, they wouldn't vent the tanks and eventually the tanks would blow up and create space debris. And that's right now one of the requirements is that you, uh, after your last stage is used, you vent all of your tanks uh, and in some cases actually try to, to put some velocity on them and bring them back down. At the end of the uh, uh, life of the satellite, you're supposed to dispose of it either by uh, an active deboost or put something on it that will, uh, that will bring it down. Uh, and, and clean up what you started. It's like if you go out hiking, what's the rule? If you go out hiking with the debris that you got. You're supposed to bring it back with you, right? You're supposed to not leave it in the forest. <clears throat> okay, here's where some of the, the, the debris comes from. Break up, 41%. Rocket bodies, 18 Payload, 6%. Um, inactive payloads is 21%, mission related debris is 12%, um, anomalous event debris is just 2%. So if you look down there uh, in the uh, uh, on-orbit fragmentation, uh, what they've uh, recorded there is deliberate breakup was 35%, propulsion system malfunction 29, unknown cause 28, batteries blew up, aerodynamics collisions. So what's the future say? The next 10 years are going to be 2,000 new objects. That's before we <coughs> come up with CubeSats. Um, new satellites that are going up. Iridium, uh, Global Star, uh, Orbcom, GPS. Everybody know what those satellites do? What does the Iridium do? Uh, yeah. It's a, it's a satellite cell phone. How about Global Star? 
same thing. Uh, Orbcom, it's a uh, s group of satellites that are storing forward. If you want to send a message someplace, and it's not big messages, it's like you got a truck traveling someplace or you got a ship out in the ocean, you want to send a message to the home office. There's a constellation of these satellites that you can send a message up to and it will store the message and then it will broadcast it down when it gets over the, the destination. So store and forward satellite. GPS, everybody knows what GPS is. Okay. Um, constellations in the future, here are two of them that they've listed but they never got funded so they're not up there. Uh, deployment of constellations, you want to put them in the final orbit with low thrust burns, deorbit with low thrust burns, um, and do we hear anything about constellations these days? What do they want to put up constellations for? <clears throat> what about looking at the, the magnetosphere? What did we say about that? They want to put a whole bunch of probably CubeSats out there to watch what happens in the, uh, in the magnetosphere. Okay, space debris. Um, some more on space debris. Who who takes who keeps track of all this? Air Force, right? Okay. Uh, why would the Air Force be the one that would keep track of it? What what is a what was a threat that's not quite as much a threat now? Ballistic missiles. So how do you know when something's coming over, whether it's a ballistic missile or a piece of space junk or a real satellite? Yeah. If you see something that's not in the catalog, then what do you do? You get a little nervous, right? So every time there's a launch, in uh, an international treaty now, they have to notify you that there's going to be a launch approximately what's the altitude, how many objects you're launching. Um, you don't have to tell the world what it is, but you have to tell them that there is something up there. So they put it in the catalog and assume it's, it's not a ballistic missile with warheads on. Uh, there have been things hit. One of the Iridium satellites had a collision that took it out. University of Surrey uh, launches these uh, satellites with a gravity gradient boom and we'll talk about that. That's where you have a big arm that sticks out on the satellite. They got hit by something that took the boom off. <coughs> Any collisions? You can see why there would be. Okay, so what are the chance of collisions? Um, in GEO, 1 in 500 now, but uh, I think it'll be more in the future. Um, what they're trying to do is have public policies to limit the amount of junk that's up there. Now, this, of all of these three things, this section here is absolutely the most important, okay? Here's the space environmental effects we looked at before, but the question is, you're the designer. What do you do to design to mitigate the effects of this? Okay, what do you do to mitigate the effects of the vacuum? Anybody got any questions or any guesses on that? How about the, ne the neutral environment? How about plasma? How about radiation? What did we say you might be able to do with radiation? Part selection and, and building? Shielding, okay. Sorry. You're not looking at your phone, are you? Okay. Just looking at your knees? <laughs> oh, I have such beautiful hands. <laughs> I, I'm suspicious when people are under the table like this. Okay. Are you ready? You're the designers. If there's anything that you want to really learn, it's the next few graphs. Okay? Vacuum. What do you do? Choose the right kinds of materials. What happens in a vacuum? It outgasses. So you vent the outgas material away from sensitive surface, sur 
surfaces. Margin allow for degradation in thermal optical properties on orbit. Pre-treat material, consider vacuum bakeouts. We do vacuum bakeouts. We go to UK, but we're going to get our own. Flight and ground operations. Provide time for the bakeout during early operation. Provide cryogenic surfaces the opportunity to warm up and outgassing outgas contaminated contamination films. What's a cryogenic system? Cold. Cold. Why would you <clears throat> what kind of things would you have a cryogenic system for? Anybody? What? Um, yeah, there are certain devices, certain uh, like cameras, spectrum uh, uh, analyzers, things like that. Certain materials you want to keep very cold. What happens between having things at room temperature and having things very cold? What about the performance of them? They're more efficient, colder. What happens to the molecules in the material as it gets colder? There's less movement. There's, and these mo movement of the molecules create noise in the system. And what happens if you can get certain materials to absolute zero? They have no resistance. If you start a current around in a loop, and you take it to absolute zero, the current will continue circulating in that loop forever because it isn't dissipated with anything. So a lot of the instruments, they want to keep cryogenically cooled. How do they keep them cryogenically cooled? In space. What do they use to do that? They actually have containers on, they fly liquid nitrogen, right. They do have some coolers that will cool them down pretty low. But if you have a large instrument, they generally fly with a, a tank with a, a liquid uh, helium, right? Liquid helium? Liquid nitrogen. One of them. Yeah. And as it warms up, what does it do? Well, it turns to a gaseous state, right? And what happens when things go from a solid or liquid state to a gaseous state? They cool things down, right? It's just like when you have ice, when ice, when you have ice, and it goes from um, a solid state to a liquid state, does it cool things down? Because you have to have heat to come in to make that change. So you're drawing heat away from things, you're cooling them down. So they have both, uh, <clears throat> they have things like, uh, they call it a doer. And uh, how many of you have a thermos bottle? Okay. Is the inside of it different? Have you looked at the inside of it? What do you see? It's kind of a glass type thing on the inside, right? And it's actually double walled. And you see there's a little thing that sticks out on the bottom. You ever notice that on a thermos bottle? You pull it out and it's glassy looking and there's a little nipple that sticks out on the, on the end. What they've done is they pulled a vacuum on it and then they've heated it so it seals it off. If you have a vacuum, it's called a vacuum thermos bottle, right? If you have a vacuum in there, what's the purpose of it? That's right. Do things stay cold in a thermos bottle? Or do they stay hot? Why? Because they're insulated. They're, yeah, they're, they're, they're insulated effectively. The, the heat can't travel out of it. So, Okay. All right. Let's go on here. So this is the vacuum environment. Okay. Here's the neutral environment. Um, material choice so that you don't get atomic oxygen degradation. Um, you want to have materials that have what's called high sputtering thresholds. What is sputtering? It's different than stuttering. What's sputtering? What's an example of something that looks like sputtering? What if you throw a rock in a mud puddle? What happens? Yeah, 
knocks stuff out, right? Sputtering is the same way. Charged particle hits the surface, knocks things off of the surface. Configuration. Aerodynamic drag can be minimized by flying the vehicle in a low cross-section area perpendicular to the ram. Orientation sensitive surfaces and optical sensors away from the ram. What is the ram? That's the front of the satellite in the velocity direction. You're ramming your way through the air, right? Okay, so if you're low enough, you can make your satellite look like an arrow, right? And it'll orient the satellite. In fact, the Russians have flown satellites that look like arrows. Okay, coating. Consider protective coatings for the surface that are, um, that are not really not susceptible to the environment. Operation, if possible, fly at an altitude that minimizes interactions. Design guidelines for the plasma. Make the exterior surface of a uniform conductivity if possible. What is the gold color on satellites? It's, what, it's, it's aluminum with allodyne preparation which takes the oxide off. ESD, what's ESD? Right, now listen to that. There's people that have been in it. What, what is that? Can you give me an example of your cat, a rug, an electrostatic discharge in the winter? <laughs> what, do you, what do you do to your cat in the winter? I'll bet all of you have done that. Scoot across the rug, right? and touch your cat or your dog, what do they do? They don't like it, right? But boy, that have you ever watched that? That's a zap. You can see that. What is it doing? It's ionizing the air, right? How much voltage do you think that is? How much, vo well, another example of electrostatic discharge is lightning outside. How much voltage do you think is there? A lot of volts, a lot of volts. Do you ever, do you ever discharge on your cat? Do you ever do that? You have never had fun. <laughs> Did you ever done that to your cat? You don't have a cat. Well, borrow somebody's and do it. <laughs> okay. Anyway, that's that's when we're talking about electrostatic discharge. When you're in the lab and working on parts. What, it, what do you do to prevent electro, electrostatic discharge from killing the parts that you're working with? Work on static resurfaces and ground yourself. Right, you ground yourself, right? Every time? Nah. Nah. You should. If you're working with sensitive parts, especially surface mounts parts, you could. So you want to be able to do that. Have an active current balance. Fly a, pa a plasma contactor or a plasma thruster. We just seen one of those. If you're charged up negative, what do you want to generate to neutralize the charge? Positive ions, right? So that's what those generators can do. Okay. Radiation environmental effects. Shielding, design parts, redundancy, Recovery algorithms, okay. This should be in your design notebook where you can always find it. Out of anything on the environment, these things are there. Common senses, design for end of life, have debris experts on the project, make sure everyone on the project is familiar with debris hazards, perform cost benefit studies uh, for uh, looking at the effects of debris orient sensitive objects that must be exposed to space on the spacecraft, trailing edge or facing the earth to decrease uh, particle strikes, make uh, critical systems redundant, don't create or leave debris in space, shield or shadow sensitive surfaces, recognize the impacts, what the effect of impacts of, of debris is going to be, consider possible damage that can happen. Okay, so that's it. The last part is the most important part. Uh, let's see, can I have you turn in the completed questions you had for yesterday, or for on Tuesday? It was supposed to be num the number one.